Good morning, church. Good morning. I am going to read from Acts um, 4, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who, who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' table, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means sons of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, Sapphira sorry, sold a property as well. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after, that, after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in as well, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the, Lord, the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Amen. Thanks, Connie. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you again. Um, so, you know, I grew up in a very budget family. Um, I don't know if you kind of relate, but my parents, when they bought something, uh, they didn't, like, they didn't um, brag about the thing that they bought. They bragged about how much discount they got. Like, sometimes you don't even know what they bought exactly. Uh, my mom would be like, 60% off. I got 60% clearance sale. Like, you know what I mean? And, and I'm like, I don't know what you even bought, mom. But, like, it, like that was the first thing. And so, um, and so that was the culture we, we, that we grew up in. So I got like secondhand stuff and, um, you know, clothes that were too big for me. Often, uh, my parents would buy stuff that I could grow into because it's like budget. And, 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 uh, and so and sometimes I got these, um, these original fakes, mics and abubas, <laughs> she box. You, you know, anybody? You've been there? And uh, so, so the combination was terrible because I would have like, I would have, I remember one day going to school and my school pants were like up here because I was growing fast, but they didn't want to buy new school pants for me. So like it would be up here and then I would have these big shoes on, like four sizes too big for me. Um, and I kind of looked a little bit like Michael Jackson, like, you know what I mean? And then, and then uh, I didn't like it because I got bullied because of it. Uh, so the kids would walk past me and they would shout, Longfooter! And then they were like, step on my, on my feet. I didn't feed it, though. Psh, there's a lot of space. Chokes on them. Uh, but so today, today, I don't, you know, I don't like uh, bargains and stuff. I'm not, when I'm, when I'm investing in money in anything, I'm always thinking quality, the best thing. I'm looking for, I'm not looking for good deals. I'm not looking for budget stuff. I'm looking for like, like what is going to work? What is going to last long? And that's because of my trauma of my childhood. So, 
So that's how I'm wired now. I'm looking for the real deal. I'm not looking for a budget deal. I'm looking for the real deal. And, and, and I want to apply that, that principle to my, to my spirituality also. Because I think for many of us, we, we know that we need help. But so often we don't know where to go to get the help. And, and, and there, is, there are all sorts of deals on offer for us. We, we go through painful things. We have, we have difficult situations. We, we need wisdom sometimes for things. We, we sometimes uh, carry some, some hurt. And, and, and there's also the offers that people make to us. Sometimes people even say, come as you are to church. And then you get given religion and you get given rules. And those don't really work. It's like change. Come as you are, but then change. No, no, no. That's not the real deal. The real deal is the Holy Spirit and His presence with us to change us. That's, the, that's what we're looking for. That's really what we need. We need God's empowering presence in our lives. I love the way they put it over here in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. We, we looked at this, I think, uh, last week. But the, 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 it says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. On all people, your, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I love it. And then later on he says, this promise is for you and for all who are far off. That's us. That promise is for us. The power and the presence of God is the thing that really produces change in our lives. That's the real deal. That's what we need to invest in. I love the stories of Samson and all of these Old Testament guys. Samson particularly was somebody who was strong. And he was strong because the, because the Spirit of God was on him. Uh, sometimes in the movies, they, they make Samson with like these big muscles. And, and the children's books they have, Samson has all these big muscles. Couldn't have been. Because people were surprised at his strength. You're not surprised when somebody like, looks like they can bench 500 kgs. No, no, no. He, his power was from the Spirit of God. And that same Spirit that was on Samson, the same Spirit that was on Moses, the same Spirit that it was even on Jesus, the spirit of power, the spirit that can, can help us to grow in holiness, that is the spirit of God that is, that is promised to us today. And so when we, when we think about this deal that's on offer, I don't want to settle for anything else. I really want God's hand in the boxing glove. Because when God's hand is in the boxing glove, then there's power in the boxing glove. My son had boxing gloves uh, when he was really young, he loved, he loved to just box me with boxing gloves. He would put his little hands in the gloves, and he would just hit with all his might. It wouldn't hurt at all, right? Because his hands are so small, and it would just tickle me. So he's hitting, he's hitting. And sometimes the church can be a little bit like that. We can be, you know, swinging and doing all sorts of things. But we don't have God's power in the, in the boxing glove. And so we don't make an impact on the world to make an impact in your, in your friendships, with your colleagues at work, with, with, uh, with your unsaved friends, in your own life to, to carry all the things, the responsibilities that you and I need to carry. We need God's hands in the glove to be able to really make an impact on the world. We need God's hands in the glove. David Yonggi Chow, uh, a theologian and pastor, says this, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the church today can never display God's power as did the early church. A combative, challenging, and victorious power to evangelize a generation. Okay, so if you're taking down notes, um, I want you to write this. And normally when pastors say, if you're taking down notes, they, they're kind of implying you should take down notes. <laughs> and they're going to get super offended if you don't. I'm joking, they're going to get offended. But here's my sermon in a nutshell today. The Holy Spirit is the real deal. Because He's the real help that produces real change. The Holy Spirit is the real deal. Because He's the real help that produces real change. Real change doesn't come from, from telling people, don't touch this, don't do this, don't look at that, don't go here. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit is the real deal. Because He's the real help that produces real change in our lives. So we're going to look at that. So let's start with real help. So this is a story that contrasts two people really, essentially. Barnabas and Ananias. And these two people are contrasted next to each other. They both start, have the same starting point. Barnabas and Ananias are in this church. The church has just started. This is early days of the new church. The Holy Spirit is poured out. And one of them says, I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And the other one says, I'm not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The one goes, I, I want the real deal. The other one says, no, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to take a different deal. The one says, listen, I'm going to be Holy Spirit led. I'm going to be Holy Spirit fed. The other one chooses differently and their lives take two very different directions and shape. And so Barnabas's life uh, it takes the shape that it does because of the Holy Spirit. Acts 4 verse 31, here's how it starts. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So Barnabas is in this group and they pray and the place is shaken and the Holy Spirit fills them. And after the Holy Spirit fills them, Barnabas gives um, sells his property and gives the money to the church, gives, his, gives the money to um, the apostles. This is how it all starts. The, the Holy Spirit fills him. And, and out of this praying and being filled with the Holy Spirit, there's this incredible generosity. And this sets the trajectory for the rest of his life. The rest of his life, he keeps growing in the things of the Spirit. And he keeps growing in leadership. So the next moment we see Barnabas, we, we know um, that uh, Barnabas in, in Acts chapter 11 is said to be a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And he leads loads of people to the Lord. He, he, gets, he, he keeps growing in the things of the Spirit, and he's leading people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then a little bit later on, a guy named Saul, who's persecuting the church, he's a Pharisee, and he's killing Christians, he's persecuting the church, and he, in a great change of events, a dramatic change of events, becomes a Christian. But the Christian leaders don't trust him. They can't blame them. He was like killing people. And they're like, okay, cool, brother. Jesus accepts you, but uh, we're going to just stay over here. Barnabas, however, full of the Holy Spirit, becomes Paul's mentor. And Barnabas takes Paul under his wing. Barnabas teaches Paul. Barnabas loves Paul. Barnabas disciples Paul. And Paul becomes this amazing leader. There's no Paul without Barnabas. And so, and, so, and so Barnabas grows in his ability to mentor and disciple people. And then the last chapter of Barnabas' life, we know that Barnabas himself becomes an apostle. Barnabas, so full of the Holy Spirit, keeps yielding more and more of his life to God, becomes an apostle. He wasn't part of the original 12, but in chapter 14, he's listed as one of the apostles alongside Paul, and he's grown possibly in leadership. He's grown in boldness. He's grown in his ability to disciple people, to love people. He's grown in generosity. He started in Acts chapter 4, but this has probably grown. He's given his whole life now to Jesus, and he becomes set apart as an apostle. What a life. What an amazing life. And I think it's so important for us to look at the evidence of a changed life like this. To look at the evidence of, of somebody changing. Perhaps the people that, these people that you know, that, that their lives have changed. Because ultimately, it proves the Holy Spirit's presence in their life. And for me as an engineer, I studied engineering. And uh, before I got into Christian ministry, I was working in it as an engineer. We are trained to be logical. We're trained to be evidence-based. We're, we're, we're trained to, to scrutinize the, the facts of situations. And so when I became a Christian, it was hard for me to accept that there is possibly a spiritual realm out there because you can't prove it. You can't look at it under a microscope. You can't see it with a telescope. And so it's hard to go, I mean, is this really that important? Because I'm investing so much into this. And, 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 and what I started to realize is that, is that th there is a proof for God. It's a different kind of proof. It's not a mathematical formula. It's not you can't see God under a microscope, under a telescope. But Jesus said, he said that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. In other words, you can see change in people's lives. You can, you can hear the effect of the wind. You can see the, 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 uh, the leaves being moving around and rustling around. You, you, can, you can see the effect. You can analyze the effect and know, actually, the only reason this has changed, the only reason that's happening is because there's wind. And so it's a different kind of proof, Jesus says. A changed life is a dramatic evidence of the presence of God. The, the science hasn't disproved God in that sense. No, no, no. The, 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 science, the science says, listen, I'm going to observe what is. Christianity, Christianity tells you why what is is. 
why this has been this way, where it all comes from. And so these are two different questions. But we have to look at people's lives who have been changed. There's a, there's a debate that happened between Le, um, uh, Oxford professor John Lennox and uh, Richard Dawkins. And they, they're debating. Uh, Richard Dawkins is an atheist. Uh, John Lennox is a Christian. And, uh, and Richard Dawkins says to John Lennox, I can't believe in a, in a spiritual realm because I can't prove it. I can't, I can't see it. I can't observe, observe it with a microscope and a telescope. So I can't trust it. And John Lennox says to him, uh, yes, you can. You can prove it. You, you, you can trust it. And, and Richard Dawkins says, no, no, I can't. I can't see it. I can't trust it. And Richard, Richard Dawkins, uh, John Lennox says to Richard Dawkins, listen, do you trust your wife? And uh, Dawkins says, I do trust my wife. And then John Lennox says to him, can you prove it with a mathematical formula? Can you, ob can you observe it under a microscope? <laughs> and Dawkins just laughs because he knows that there's a different kind of evidence. There's an evidence where you experience something. I don't trust such because of a mathematical formula. No, no, I've experienced something. And it's a similar thing with the power of the Spirit. He comes and He, and he changes you. He, he, you say yes to, to the real deal, to the power, of the, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you experience real change. And that proves the power of God. So often we say no to the real deal, and it just makes life harder than what it already is. It's, it's like people who go camping. I mean, I'm not judging anybody here. He, each to their own. But campers, you know what you do. You know, it's raining outside. You, like the wilder, the better. You, like, there's like, lions and tigers. You want to go and be there. Camping is like real life, but just much harder. It's like, it's like real life with, without, with stage 10, no electricity. <laughs> right? So, I, so I'm just asking, why, why, why make life harder than what it already is? You know what I mean? We've already got load shedding. You know, like so sometimes I see, so, sometimes I see people in like in the malls with like with, with four kids and a granny with them, and then instead of going up the escalator, they take the stairs, and then I just go, why? You know what I mean? Well, why would you do that? They're busy losing their mind with the kids. The kids are running in five different directions, and I'm just cruising up the up the escalator, da, 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 watching them at the airports. You know those travelators. Those the things that make you go faster. It's like a flat escalator. Sometimes I literally see people carrying tons of bags with kids, and then they choose the steps. Maybe it's discovery points they want. I don't know. <laughs> but they choose. They cho they just they literally choose. And I like I cruise past them on the thing. I'm like, hi. You know what I mean? Why? I, I I don't know. I don't know why we sometimes choose the harder option and make life more complicated than it already is, and yet. That's what happens in the church when it comes to the Holy Spirit. We're called to rely on the power and the presence of God. And we go, no, no, it's not for me. So I'm, I'm not going to go into this. I'm not going to rely on this. No, no, no. Listen, when we call onto God, we're, we're being equipped. We're being emp empowered to live out the supernatural call that we all have in supernatural power. The supernatural holiness and the supernatural generosity can only happen through the supernatural empowering of the presence of God. And He is offering that to each and every one of us. The promise is for you and for all who are far off. And that is what He says over and over again in different ways. Paul puts it like this. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit every single day. You say, God, please, won't you send your Holy Spirit to me? I really need your strengthening today as I take this next step. I really need your empowering. Whatever it is that you're going through, perhaps it's an addiction that you're trying to overcome. God, I'm feeling that craving again. Please, won't you fill me with your Spirit as you walk day by day? Father, my anger is out of control. My anxiety is out of control. My materialism is, is out of control. I'm not being generous. Please, won't you just, won't you fill me up? And the Holy Spirit comes and we do not gratify the desires of the flesh. He also says, sow to the Spirit. When you sow something, something grows normally, right? And he says, sow to the Spirit. And then he says, here's what will grow. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Man, this is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. This is, I know the Holy Spirit's, Received so much bad PR. 
And we've all had like situations where people who have misrepresented the Holy Spirit have just been weird. I remember myself one time being prayed for by a pastor, and then he put my hands in this weird grip, like he did this thing with my hand, and I, so I couldn't bend my arm. And then I was getting pushed backwards, and then I just gave the charity fall. You know what I mean? Where you're just like, I don't want to make a scene. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna fall over here. <laughs> who hasn't done a charity fall? <laughs> we all got church trauma. But this is really what the Holy Spirit does. That, that's not what it is about. This is what it's about. The Holy Spirit is good. The Holy Spirit is holy. The Holy Spirit will make you holy. The third person of the Trinity is good. We need Him. I know Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Bible isn't in the Bible also. <laughs> but we trust the Bible. So we can trust the Holy Spirit. He produces patience in us and self-control and gentleness in us. He is the real deal. Anything else is not real help. Anything else will cause us to fall short. It's like doing camping and, and, and won't, really, won't really help us. It's not weird. It's not unscientific to rely on the Holy Spirit and, and His empowering. So number one, the Holy Spirit is our real help. And number two, the Holy Spirit brings about real change in our lives. Now there's a contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and there are three ways at least, there's a couple of more, but three ways at least that change happens in uh, Barnabas' life and, and change happens in our, in our lives. The number one is real generosity, real friendship, and then real identity. Real generosity. Ananias chooses to rely on money rather than on the Holy Spirit. That's what essentially happens. And he holds back some of the money and, 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 and he, you know, he, he can't let go of it. He, 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 he grows in materialism. Barnabas grows in the things of the Spirit and loves money less. As the Spirit comes, we're able to let go. We're able to be generous and redirect our resources. That's what this is about. This is about ultimately who we ultimately rely on. Who, who's ultimately our, our, our security? Where do we ultimately run for safety? This is what happens in the disciples' lives in verse 34. This is what the Holy Spirit does from time to time. Those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put them at the apostles' feet. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, also sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. In contrast, Ananias makes the same decision. I'm going to sell the property. But he's trying to mimic the Holy Spirit-led generosity of Barnabas and the others. And he's trying to mimic it, but he's doing it in his natural strength. So he sells his property, and then he looks at the money, and he goes, oh, I'm not going to give all of this. <laughs> I, I need some of this for that new falafel place I've been wanting to go to, extreme falafels. <laughs> you know, I really want to get sp spinners for my camel. I've been really like, like, like I want like those cool neon lights underneath the camel. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to keep this this bit over here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the rest. As we, as we grow in the things of the Holy Spirit, we, our, our reliance and, and the sense of fear that we need to have money and stuff, that that's the ultimate provision, starts to diminish. And God gives us a heart for the things that He has a heart for. Peter says to him, listen, you didn't have to even sell the field. It was your field. Nobody was under compulsion. It says from time to time as things arose, maybe the church wanted to do something special. Maybe there was a need for some, for, for some, uh, for some area. As, from time to time as, as matters arose, people led by the Holy Spirit gave. And Peter says to him, listen, it was your stuff in the first place. Verse 4, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Then after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? So the Holy Spirit's moving powerfully. And Ananias wants to mimic the Holy Spirit-led generosity, but he's not able to. Later on, it says to us that this church was growing. It, just, it, was, it, it says in Acts chapter 2, daily they were being saved. Thousands of people were getting saved. Why? I think in part it's because of this, um, this attractive generosity, this anti-materialism that people saw. And let me say something. Anti-materialism is as hot as it's ever been. I want to say to you that, that generosity is still, people are still, the world is still looking for a generous people. The, right now, a war is being fought between Russia and the Ukraine. And at the heart of this war, whatever view you have on what's going on, it's about money and power. 
That's at the heart of what's going on. It could involve other countries. It could involve nuclear war. And so, and so even young people today are going, man, we're dreaming about a different world. Young people today all over the world are going, the ideologies and the systems of this world produce produce inequality, it produces war, it produces greed. It's not just a South African phenomenon. Inequality is on the rise across the globe. And people all over are going, what do we do? Is there something different? Acts chapter 4 is the answer. Radical generosity by the power of the Holy Spirit is the answer. That's what the world so longs for. Generosity like this, a people that can display the power of God through through being able to say, you know, this stuff doesn't define me. The, the, the cars, the money, the wealth doesn't define me. Sometimes we say, Joy said it this morning, we give as an extension of our worship. And what that means is that worship is, is always a response to revelation. It's always a response to who God is. We see something of who he is, of his beauty, of his grace, and we respond in worship. So thank you so much for dying in my place for my sin. And, and giving is part of that. We go, man, you've given your son for me. I, I, I give as an extension of my worship to you. And the Holy Spirit will come and will reveal stuff about who God is and what he's done in our lives. And we'll respond and we'll go, man, I, I worship you with my money. I'm so grateful that you've included me and the people of God. We've welcomed people in this morning. The Holy Spirit will come and go, man, listen, I want to renew Johannesburg with the gospel. Without the Holy Spirit, you can look at Johannesburg and say, it's impossible. You can look at South Africa, you can go, man, it's impossible. There's no way we can re renew this thing. This is, things are bad. But the Holy Spirit will come and inspire you and say, listen, I want you to give to this because we can do it. It's only something that the Holy Spirit does. And then we use our money for the extension of his kingdom. The Holy Spirit will come. And, and when we feel fearful in releasing money, in giving, in being generous towards the poor, or towards others, the Holy Spirit will come and remind you, hey, listen, didn't Jesus promise that he would give you the kingdom? He, I said, do not be fearful, little flock. I want you to give, I want to give you the kingdom. And then he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. It's only the Holy Spirit that can do that in us. Tithe, the word tithe means tenth. It means that everything that I have belongs to Him. Every single thing, all of it comes from Him, and from His own do I give. And the Holy Spirit will come and say, listen, remind me. Remind me, Holy Spirit, my help comes from You. Everything I have comes from You. It's, it's not, it, it, this is not about not loving money or not enjoying money. This is not about, uh, you know, uh, not making money. Please make as much money as you can and enjoy your hardened cash. This is about who I turn to, who's my ultimate hope. When things go wrong in my life, what is the first thing I do? Do I, do I start working harder and start stressing and making financial plans to get myself out of the situation? No, no, this is about saying, you are my ultimate hope, Lord. You are my ultimate help. There's an old song that I, I used to sing when, when I would feel, when I would feel, is this thing on? Oh, you see, you know, your money is worth right here. <laughs> I, I sometimes feel stressed out about money and I, and I would sing this old song. It just goes, I will lift up mine eyes. Do you remember this? <laughs> to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. You remember? Yeah. The maker of heaven and earth. He said he will not suffer thy foot, thy foot to be moved. The Lord which keepeth thee, he will not slumber or sleep. shall preserve thy soul even forevermore come on oh my help my help my help all of my help cometh
that's, and as I would sing that, I would just, the Holy Spirit would help me. It, it would be me walking, staying in step with the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come and help me. Say, Ryan, listen, you don't have to worry about the money. I will provide. I'm your help. I'm your help. That's what it's about. Number two, and then we, real quickly, it also produces real friendship in our lives because at the heart of what's going on over here is more than just money. It's about hypocrisy. It's about Ananias using the community, needing approval. That's what it's about. Ananias sells the property, and then he says to everybody, listen, I, I, I've sold the property for so much, and you can have all of it. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to lie about it. Why is he doing that? Because he wants the approval. He wants to be seen like Barnabas is seen. He wants to be seen like everybody else is seen. He wants the social capital perhaps to impress people, impress leaders. And he says, no, no, this is, this is everything, but it isn't. And so sometimes we can find the light in the approval of other people instead of the approval of God by his Holy Spirit. This is Pastor John Piper. He has this famous statement that he says, uh, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And what He means is that when God is my chief delight, when, when, when His presence doesn't, there's, when nothing can compare to, to His presence with me, when He is the number one thing, not the approval of people, no, not, not money, not anything else, when God is our chief delight, He is most glorified in us. The inverse is also true. When everything else is, com is, is less, when I mean, everything else is more than God, when, when, when my chief delight is the approval of people, money, you know, when my happiness increases with my salary, then God is not glorified in me. That's what he's saying. And so what the Holy Spirit does in our lives is it produces real friendships because real friendships are birthed out of a place of not needing the approval of people and not relying on the approval of people. And then lastly, real identity. It, it says that, all the believers were one in heart and mind. And that is a phrase that is actually repeated. It comes up in chapter 2. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. And so what this is about is more than money. It's saying that the, the disciples became this new community. They were, they were a disparate group. At the beginning, you remember what the disciples were like? I mean, you had like a zealot with them. One of the zealots, the zealot, Simon was a zealot, and a zealot was somebody that was like the Encontu Siswe of, of Israel. They wanted the violent overthrow of Rome. Uh, so, so, so Simon was packing. He was like ready to, you know, go to war against Israel. And then you had a um, tax collector. You had Matthew, a tax collector. And, and Jesus put them in the same group. And then this is what happens when the Holy Spirit came. They became one in heart and mind. It was real, real unity. They, they, they left their, their other identities behind. If you're a Liverpool supporter, hello Liverpool. <laughs> you know you're an extremist. You've got tattoos. I've seen them, Dave. I mean, be, be, being a Liverpool supporter is like being part of a gang. You literally will, you'll attack Manchester supporters. I've seen Liverpool supporters that are bright. They don't know each other. These men don't know each other at all. And then they just get into a room together. They start talking Liverpool. It's like they've been best friends forever. <laughs> right? One heart. That's what this is about. It's about saying, listen, we are one heart. But even if you were a Liverpool supporter before your conversion and you hated Manchester United supporters, once you, become in, once you are in Christ, you leave that and you say, listen, I still love Liverpool, but I'm not going to kill a Manchester supporter because he's my brother in Christ now. Okay? It's <laughs> easy. Okay. Come Holy Spirit. So this is about saying, listen, those old groups that used to define me, we all need a group. Every single human being needs a group, and group thinkers will. We're defined by groups. Jesus says, I've given you a new spirit, and I've put you in a new group to live out a new way. That's what it's about. And so we're called to live out this new way. Forget the old ways. Paul says, forget what lies behind. Press on to take hold of what Jesus has taken hold of you for, but you need the Holy Spirit's help to produce the Holy Spirit's change in your life. So I want to pray for you. Ben, won't you come on up? And we just want to make an opportunity for you to just come and receive again. We've got a team of people that are here to pray. Chantal and her team are here to pray with you. 
And so what we want to do is just wait on the Lord to fill us up, to strengthen us, to produce the holiness, the holiness that only He can produce in our lives. Let's stand together. One of the things that I know that happens when we come to, to receive from the Holy Spirit is sometimes it can feel a little bit like, oh, I don't want to give away control. It's like weird. I'm, I'm scared of just saying, Holy Spirit, fill me. I want, I, just imagine you went to a hospital because you broke your arm and then you got to the hospital and there was a sign that says, external injury go this way, internal injury go that way. And you go, okay, external injury go this way. And then you can see another sign that says, uh, upper body go this way, lower body go this way. And you go, okay, upper body go this way. You go down the upper body and then you get down the wall and it says exit and you're back at your parking lot at your car with your broken arm. And your wife asks you, did you get help? Was it helpful? And you say, yeah, no, it was very organized. No chaos, but they didn't help me. The real deal is that the Holy Spirit is here to help us in order to change us. It might feel a little bit chaotic sometimes. It might be a little bit of tears. We, there might be some rattlesnakes and doom. Kidding. You know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Just joking. There's no rattlesnakes and doom. But sometimes we can feel, man, I want order. I, I, I choose a lack of order any day, tears any day, to get help, to get fixed up. And so won't you do that? Won't you just come to him and say, Lord, I, I really want help. I want help with the things in my, my life, you know, whatever it might be, materialism, or it could be anything, whatever it is. I, just maybe open your hands in front of you and say, Lord, I, I want you to fill me afresh. I give you control. Holy Spirit of God, we come before you. You are our real help. We believe that you bring real change in our lives. And so we come to you, the great power source, third person of the Trinity. We want to say you are welcome here. We trust you. You are good. There is no one like you. You are holy, holy, holy. You hovered over creation and you brought order out of the disorder and the chaos. You came into Barnabas' life and you, you changed him around and you, and you made him a leader and a wonderful person. We want that too, Lord. And so we pray the prayer that the disciples prayed, that the church has been praying for thousands of years. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of the living God. Fall fresh on us. We need you, Lord. Maybe just pray that in your own heart. Come, Holy Spirit, come.